We've got our two texts today. The first is from Math Mark. We've been kind of working slowly through Mark this summer. And we are in chapter 5. I've been reading from the Common English Version. All right. Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him, My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she heard that Jesus, about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him, so he turned in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, don't you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward, knowing what had happened to her. She fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house, saying to Jairus, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, don't be afraid, just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw them all out. Then taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Young woman, get up. Suddenly the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. Like last week, we're going to... So with her book, Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown has provided us with an anthology of human emotion. And rather than list the emotions like a glossary in alphabetical order, she groups them together based on reactions to our environment. So for example, there's a group of emotions that occur when things are uncertain or too much, like stress, worry, excitement, fear. And then there's a group of emotions for when we compare, like admiration, envy, resentment. And then there is a group of emotions for when we are hurting. They are anguish, hopelessness, despair, sadness, and grief. She writes, anguish is an almost unbearable and traumatic swirl of shock, incredulity, grief, and powerlessness. Anguish often causes us to physically crumple in on ourselves, literally bringing us to our knees or forcing us all the way to the ground. I have not shared much with you about my late husband. I do understand a few of you have read the memoir that I wrote about the first seven years of his diagnosis with MS. So forgive me for those of you who have read this story. At one point, the house we lived in had mirror doors on the bedroom closet. And there was a, probably a good six feet between the closet and the bed. And so that was, you know, my 
getting ready for the day area. <clears throat> but it often became also a space where I would sit on the floor and pray for the day. A lot of the time, my prayers were silent, and even more of the time, my prayers were tearful. Watching my husband lose his mobility slowly and having to help him more and more was really, really hard. So there was a day, just one day, where Pete decided that he could no longer drive anymore. And he never told us what happened, if there was an incident, or what prompted this immediate change. But it was immediate. And it was during that time where I remember not sitting by my closet door, but I sort of crumpled down on myself, and I laid there by the closet. And I was crying, and I was rubbing my hands on the mauve-colored carpet. <laughs> Gotta love the 80s. And I pulled a piece of the carpet up, and I looked at it, and I thought, I have cried a hole in my carpet. <laughs> anguish. Brown says this also, the amount, the element of powerlessness is what makes anguish traumatic. We're unable to change, reverse, or negotiate what has happened. Sometimes we distract ourselves with lists of things to do or tasks, but eventually anguish finds its way back to us. This is what I sense from the father, Jairus, and the unnamed woman in these two stories. Mark likes to couple stories together, and so here we've, he begins with a story of a father who is powerless. His 12-year-old daughter is dying. Anguish, hopelessness, despair, sadness, grief. He humbly comes to Jesus. He kneels before him. Kneeling is not something we do often. When we picture this man, we see that his anguish has led him to humility. He's willing to be vulnerable and exposed. And at the same time, his anguish, in his anguish, his despair or his grief that has also caused him to have hope or to be courageous. He has faith, and so he reaches out for help. And then Jesus begins to walk to meet his little girl. A woman in the crowd also reaches out for help. She quite literally reaches out. She touches Jesus, and she is immediately healed. And we know the scene, right? Jesus turns around looking, and the woman cannot remain anonymous. She steps forward, also kneeling before him, and she tells him the whole story. Now remember, Jairus is waiting for Jesus to come to his home. And so Jairus and the disciples and the crowd are all there hearing her whole story. Twelve years of anguish and hopelessness and despair and sadness and grief. The exhaustion of being sick, of trying something new, of being disappointed, then trying something again, and still no relief. This woman began her journey with sickness the same year the little girl was born. When someone is sick for a long time, I know you've witnessed this, not even a long time sometimes, there is a tendency to lose friends. People get weary around long sicknesses. We are uncomfortable with powerlessness. We want to fix things, and it when becomes clear that we cannot fix it, or it is unfixable. We often avert our eyes, our hearts, our hands. The group of emotions that occur when things don't go as planned are boredom, disappointment, regret, discouragement, resignation, and frustration. So I wonder how many of this woman's friends, neighbors, even family, have walked away 
out of resignation or frustration with her illness. She doesn't have that luxury, of course. Instead, her anguish leads her to risk, just like Jairus. She finds courage and bravery. She, too, has faith. And so she reaches out for help. So what we have in these two stories is an example of how desperation, anguish, hopelessness, sadness, and grief motivated a woman and a father to seek healing from Jesus. When I came to be your pastor, I understood my primary tasks in this first year to be healing and truth-telling. And since I've been with you, I have tried to name the hurt of this last year from different perspectives. My biggest concern is that we would rather not name the hurt, not look at it directly. Instead, we would try to ignore it or pretend it didn't happen. So let me ask what happens to a wound that is left not tended to. In this last year, Hopewell Presbyterian Church has experienced manipulation and betrayal. There was shock and grief, disappointment and sadness. There was embarrassment that the town was and maybe still is talking about us. There was shame. There was lying and secrets. In fact, the investigation itself had a secrecy that was shrouded as confidentiality. And there was a hope to control something that was out of our control. Lives fell apart. There was and still is a loss of relationships. There is a loss of trust. There is a loss of family and friends, a loss of employment, a loss of homes for those who were at the apex of the trauma. And while it appears that some people have landed on their feet, let's be honest, that's not true. And while it appears that us as a family of faith are moving forward, I have yet to meet with anyone within our church or outside of our church that does not still want to talk about it, their feelings and their confusion. The hurt is still very real. I want to take a breath. While no one wants to experience desperation and anguish, hopelessness, sadness, and grief, no one wants to experience those things. Those emotions were what motivated Jairus and the nameless woman to seek healing from Jesus. So I'd like to submit that those emotions that we would, as humans, prefer to ignore might actually be the very thing that motivates us to seek healing from Jesus, too. In both of these stories, it was anguish that led to faith. In both of these stories, it was faith that healed them. I realized as I sat down this morning in the front pew that I was terrified to give this sermon. It is incredibly hard 
to feel our emotions sometimes. I know. You know. But what if What if we allowed ourselves to feel the anguish? What if we allowed ourselves to have anguish lead to faith? And what if our faith heals us? Amen. As you are able, let's sing number four, seven.